sing this song. Elevate your voice. Let him hear, oh God. Receive the worship of praise. Give God praise, church.
for the blood you have shed for a friend. Thank you, Jehovah. Church, God is ready to pour the spirit upon our nation, upon this church, our fellowship, and most of all, receive your blessing tonight. Worship.
your spirit, God, we need you, Lord Jesus. Oh, God, we are so grateful, Lord. Get a la rapas. Amen. We're going to go before the Lord in prayer. Always remembering our leadership church in Prescott, Arizona, Pastor Greg, Sister Lisa Mitchell, the assistants, Pastor Jesse and Bethany Morales, both on staff there in Prescott. Pray for our church here in Ogden, Utah. Pastor Rick Martinez, Mama Ceci, the assistants, Pastor Garrett, Monica Berry, uh, our pastor as he's away, uh, that God would cover them. Uh, Miguel and Victoria Lada as they're in Cambodia right now preaching the gospel. Uh, we pray for Pastor Garrett as he ministers the word of God, that God would touch our heart, minister to every single person in this place. Pray for our evangelist, Donnell Butler, that God would continue to bless, anoint his ministry. Pray for the staff here. Ogden. We pray for our baby works that have been sent out from Ogden, those in the state of Utah, out of state, Idaho, California, Missouri, Albuquerque, those overseas that God would pour out his spirit in their churches, in their nation. Pray for our government, our president, our troops in harm's way, our first responders, that God would put a hedge of protection around these people. We continue to lift up Sister Whitney, who is here with us tonight. Amen. That God will continue to heal her body. We continue to pray for Patty Gomez, a speedy recovery. Julia, this is Angie's sister, that God will do a work in her body. We pray for the needs that are presented here tonight, for the projector that God would move. How many have any needs you want to bring before the throne of grace? We're going to cry out to God as we do. Uh, Brother Philip Torres, go ahead and open us up in prayer. Let's cry out to God, church. Praise God, you could be seated in this place this evening. I welcome you out um, on behalf of Pastor Rick Martinez, his wife, Ceci, uh, the senior pastor here. We welcome you to the Potter's House Christian Center, Ogden, Utah. Amen. Where Jesus Christ is still in the business of changing lives. Amen. Hallelujah. Just a couple of announcements to make known to you, especially if you're visiting for the first time. We have church also on Wednesday nights, and so if we meet here, you want to come and pray with us, 6.30 p.m., service begins at 7.30, but come worship with us, serve God with us, um, get involved in what God's doing in these last days, and let Him use your life, amen. And then tomorrow is going to be a day of prayer and fasting, amen, so this is something we've been doing as a church for a long time, uh, uh, gosh, probably going on, I, anybody remember when that started? It was years ago, a long time ago anyway, uh, but something we do as a congregation, some of you weren't even alive I think when it started, but uh, you know, a long time ago, Pastor Martinez's burden for this city challenged the church to fast and pray on Wednesday nights, and we haven't stopped, amen, and so I want to encourage you and challenge you, amen, as a congregation, let's meet here tomorrow together to pray at 6.30 p.m., if you can fast all day, amen, uh, just lay hold of God for many of these needs you heard to, heard to, uh, tonight during our prayer request. Uh, let's believe God together. And as stated this morning, Salt Lake City is in revival this week. Amen. With uh, uh, Pastor Tim Miller, and he's going to be ministering through Thursday. And so we're going to open that up for Tuesday and Thursday. Go be a part of that. Support our brother. Amen. Support that revival and let God minister to you in that. Um, and 
And also, don't forget, this Friday we continue on with our home Bible studies. And these are various places around the city. If you, if you don't have a location to go to, I encourage you to find one. Uh, if you don't know where they're at, you can see any one of these ushers in the back. See myself. Uh, we'll find you a location so you can go learn the Word of God. And then as our young disciples, men of God, rising up to be preachers, uh, are leading these Bible studies, can you say amen? Amen. On Saturday, amen, we are taking an impact team with uh, to uh, Blackfoot, Idaho, to help out one of our grandbaby churches over there. Uh, this is Pastor Jesus Bayo, amen, out of the West Valley Church. Amen. He's been there uh, for several months now. God's doing a tremendous work, and we're going to go support that. And there is a sign-up list in the back uh, in the foyer, and so if you need a ride, put your name on there. Amen, amen. And on Wednesday is the last day you can put your name on there, okay? Please, please don't call, you know, ah, I didn't get a chance to sign up, you know. I'm telling you now. Amen. Because, you know, we're going to be here tomorrow night. We're going to be here again on Wednesday night. Uh, and so commit to the van if you're going to go on it. Uh, that'll be a great blessing to those that want to go. Hallelujah. And then, uh, praise God. Last announcement. A week from tomorrow, our area-wide men's, uh, men's discipleship class. Amen. With Pastor Kevin Foley. And so we're excited for that. That's going to be a tremendous time. Hallelujah. That's all the announcements we have tonight. Let's give God praise as our ushers come. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. God, we give you glory. We give you praise tonight. And, amen. What a tremendous, tremendous thing it is. Think about this. Uh, past, our pastor, amen, uh, this church was able to send him. Not only that, but uh, Brother Miguel, Sister Victoria uh, 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 raised their own money, paid their own way. Amen. They're in Cambodia, Siem Reap, Cambodia right now, preaching the gospel. Amen. Evangelizing the streets. Um, I, I don't think Miguel ever thought he'd be over there. Amen. I don't think Victoria ever thought Miguel would be over there. Amen. <laughs> but they're there. Amen. Reaching the reaching the world for Jesus. Amen. Uh, just just a tremendous thing that God is doing. The fact that we can send churches to Cambodia, to India, to China, uh, to South America, all over the world, reaching the world for Jesus. Um, amen. Sending uh, 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 white people into China, uh, black people into India. Amen. Sending uh, white people into Cambodia. Amen. Sending Mexico down to South America and sending white people down to South America, amen, reaching the whole world for Jesus, um, hallelujah, that's what we invest in tonight, amen, we, it's not just lip service, uh, amen, but we give to that, amen, if you're, you, you, you give your tithe, praise God, give your offerings besides as the Bible commands us to, I want to challenge you tonight, if you're not giving to world evangelism, amen, I challenge you, start doing that, Amen. My wife and I made a decision years ago, amen, when we were pioneering in Tucson, uh, that, you know what, we're going to make this a personal thing. Is it not, not just as a church, you know, as a church, we, we give the world evangelism, but as a personal thing, we dedicate uh, a certain amount of money every month, every paycheck that's going to go back to world evangelism because we want to reach the world for Jesus. I want to tell you, God has, has, has done a, just a powerful work in Tucson. We saw eight different nationalities in our church. We pioneered there. Amen. We've pioneered and pastored in China. Amen. Ministered in various places around the world. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, God's able to do that in anybody. If we'll just challenge him and say, God, I, I, I believe in this. I'm, I'm going to invest in this. I'm going to believe God to do something through my giving tonight. Um, and so let's give tonight, church. Let's honor the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. Uh, amen. And I challenge you once again, you give to world evangelism. And Lord bless you in that. Why don't we bow our hearts? Um, I'm going to ask if uh, my brother Neto, you'd pray over the gift and the giver. Amen. Lord bless you as you give tonight. Amen. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom.
Amen. Thank you, musicians and platform workers. Amen. Thank you for your labors. So we want to uh, dismiss the children's church. Amen. Can head on over. Hallelujah. Look at all that. Future preachers, evangelists. Amen. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 10, if you have your Bibles tonight. Acts 10, I want to go to the Word of God there. I want to minister tonight a sermon I've entitled The Personality Test. And this is, I was telling one of the brothers before church, I said, I don't know how this one's going to fly. It's one of those sermons. Um, you know, it's so pray for me. Amen. <laughs> uh, we're going to believe God tonight. Uh, but something that, that's, that has been triggered over the course of Years now, um, when I was working in, uh, I was working in a large organization from 2015 to 2018 in uh, Orem, Utah, and uh, even was continued to work there from home um, after we moved into Ogden. But it was a larger organization, and how many know when you get when you get a large group of people like this, uh, uh, you know, a large crowd. Uh, a large organization, you got a whole lot of different personalities in there. <laughs> in that in that company, I remember the, 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 the company had us all take this, this test. Some of you are going to know what it is, the Myers-Briggs test. How many have ever had to take that? Raise your hand. All right, so it's, it's, a, it's a personality test. And, uh, you know, we all took this test, and it, it, it basically labels you with within one of the 16 different personality types um, that, that are in there. And then you could put up that uh, picture, uh, the, 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 the Myers-Briggs one, the one with all the letter codes and all that. But uh, sorry, I thought we had a better image, but that's kind of what it all means to me anyways. You know, I don't understand it, but... Uh, <laughs> But in, in this, you've got 16 of these boxes, right? And they're all four-digit uh, four letter code. And, and so you take the test. Now, once, once we got identified of what our personality type was, they had us print out our four-digit letter code and hang it on our cubicle so that when we would, uh, you know, be walking around, you know, doing our job and we'd, we'd go to the next person's cubicle, uh, you know, they would be identified as, I don't know, it's one of those ISTP or, and uh, that relates to a certain type of, of personality. And uh, the, the whole idea was this is, this is now, you know, uh, one of the world's ways of helping people relate to one another. So how, how, how do you know that that person over there, you know, how do you work with that mean person over there? <laughs> how, do, how do you work uh, with that shy person uh, in the cubicle next to you that never lifts his head up from his desk? Uh, you know, how, how, and, and, and it's an, the idea is to help you to function together as humanity. <laughs> some of you may have heard some of these other big terms, and they're actually part of this Myers-Briggs, but uh, things like introvert and extrovert, right? An introvert, uh, uh, a shy person uh, who doesn't reveal their thoughts or feelings very readily. Whereas the extrovert, uh, right? They're outgoing, overtly expressive person. They're gonna let you know how they feel and how good they're doing and how great they are and, and all those kind of things. Where the introvert is the, is the, is the person that, you know, they're, they're the kind of person that are like, they'll, they'll shut the door, turn off the lights, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, live in darkness, and they're happy with it. And so, they, but this, what, what's interesting about this is, is now what's happening is people all over the world now identify with these different uh, uh, personality types. So how does this look? So I, let me explain. I grew up, I, I, know, I know I may seem like an outgoing person. Well, let me be honest, I get very nervous when I'm up here. Uh, my, my hand used to shake. 
stop. <laughs> stop it. Uh, you know, and it, it, it's taken it's taken a long time to get over that. But uh, you know, I grew up. I was I was a band nerd. You know, you know what a band nerd? I, I played trumpet from seventh grade to to twelfth grade. I, I got a scholarship to go to college to play trumpet. And when I wasn't playing trumpet, uh, I was playing video games. My first job was at McDonald's. Man, would you like fries with that? Would you like a free smile? We, had that, we actually had that sign on our sign, ask for a free smile. I hated it. But, but the whole time I worked there, I kept asking them, please let me work in the back. I don't want to be up front here. <laughs> I don't like people. Right? <laughs> I worked in a banquet serving for two years at a Marriott's and, and uh, after about six months there, I said, listen, I, 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 I need to work in the back. <laughs> you need to put me behind those doors where there's no people. And I'll, I'll get all the food ready and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, I'll make sure that those servers are taken care of and, and they, they get the food on time. And, you know, by, by the definition, you could have considered me an introvert. I did not want to be around groups of people. Amen. I didn't like to be around groups of people. Amen. Unless uh, they would leave me alone. (laughs) You know, I'll be honest. I'm completely comfortable playing second chair. And that's, that's just the absolute truth. But the reality is that's not where life has taken me. Life has taken me in places where my career, many times I was serving in public places. Outside of my comfort zone, had to come out of that zone. And like I said, every time I get up here, I got the butterflies. I got to get warmed up a little bit. You know, I've got to, uh, you know, I've got to uh, kind of break the ice. And, uh, you know, and that's why, you know, when you guys are just staring at me looking all mean, I get a little nervous. So I want to look at this, and, and I, I hope this isn't too deceiving, but I'm going to take this a direction you might not be expecting. But Acts chapter 10, 34, it says this, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I, per- I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. I want to look first this evening at segregating the human race. And I want to dive into some of this, some of this, these, you know, these, these personality tests and, and, and just, just a tad bit, just to build a foundation. Amen. But one of the earliest personality tests or, or types that, that came out was called the four temperament theory. Go ahead and put that picture up there. Amen. Maybe. The one with the ugly faces. And it'll come up in a minute, but... It suggests that there are four fundamental personality types. And so uh, one of them is called sang- sanguine. Uh, another one's called choleric. One's called melan- melancholic. And uh, another one's called phlegmatic. Now don't ask me how they came up with those names. Uh, there it is. So, so, okay, this is for real. so a Greek physician many of you know him Hippocrates he developed this whole theory into medical theory he believed that certain human moods emotions and behaviors were caused don't laugh by an excess or lack of bodily fluids which he classified as blood yellow bile black bile and phlegm. And so depending on how much of these bodily fluids you had would determine your personality type. Now, this is what the human race has come up with. Now, if you, if you, if you fast forward uh, uh, a couple thousand years, uh, amen, you'll find many of this has been disproven, uh, that there are other things, uh, amen, like your language you speak that can determine your personality. But what's interesting is this theory is believed to have originated in Mesopotamia, 
which happens to be where the land of Shinar is located, which happens to be where the united human race began building a city and a tower to try to reach heaven. Now I'm going somewhere with this because this is where God said this can't be and he came down and he confounded all the people in all the languages and he separated them and spread them out through all the earth. Now I don't know what exactly that looked like when that happened, but I can speculate. Some of you watched The Chosen, a whole video series on speculation. Anyway, um, but think about this. Can you imagine what began to happen? God comes down. They're all talking to each other. They've got a great plan. They're of one mind, one accord. They're building a city and a tower into heaven. They they're, 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 they're want to be great, just like every human being uh, wants to be great. Uh, and all of a sudden, uh, amen. Uh, the, uh, ¿Dónde está el baño? Muy más Taco Bell. You didn't know I could say that, didn't you? And others are like, Olama, Olama, Olama. In Chinese, that means, are you hungry? And others are, 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 parlez-vous français? And the Americans are like, hey, what's up? But think about this. Instead of trying to figure out how to communicate with each other, People began creating different societies. And the next thing you know <laughs> is you got the Spanish mama in charge of the home. You've got the Chinese started becoming emotionless. You've got the French people starting to wear skinny jeans. And you got the Americans thinking they're all that. Hello. Listen, in all seriousness, studies have shown that bilingual people tend to take on a different personality when speaking a different language. Someone said a change in language changes the development, the respective output, and the general direction of a conversation, which essentially changes the behavior in the long run. Now that's some insight there, because what this potentially means is that since the time of the confounding of all the languages, personalities begin to become different, character traits, behaviors. You know what a personality is? It's the combination of the characteristics and the qualities that form your individual distinctive character. You say, what did you just say? <laughs> it's what makes you, you. I want you to catch on to this because... Ever since that time, man has then been trying to figure out how do we get control of this? Because now we got all these languages, all these societies, all these cultures, uh, all these uh, races, uh, and uh, how do we get everybody to get along? So what's man's solution? Well, uh, when you go to apply for a job now, you have to take a personality test. At your companies, they give you a personality test. Uh, uh, you know, come up uh, with some crazy belief system that segregates people and divides people even more based solely on, a, on an idea that bodily fluids uh, change your behaviors. They come up with four-letter combinations that define me as a person as you as a person. And then somehow I've got to try to relate to you based on that. So you might ask, well, why even bring this up? What are you talking about? Uh, amen. Listen, I want to establish a very real reality tonight that we all face um, is man will always attempt to unite mankind with divisive methods. Let me say that again. Mankind will always try to unite mankind with divisive uh, methods. Uh, here we are with the Myers-Briggs, uh, and I'm not saying it's completely bad. It's nice, gives nice insight to each individual life. Uh, amen. But it's not always true because you can lie your way through those questions. In turn, outside of Christ, we are now left ever divided attempting to enforce conformity on every person with man's methods in other words you need to like me because this is who i am 
Hello. Tell me we don't see that today. You, you, need, you need to, you, and, and we've taken as far now, say, well, I'm born this way. I was born gay. I was born, uh, you know, an alcoholic. I was born this, and you need to accept me for who I am. Instead of just calling it sin. We don't call sin, sin anymore. No, we make up a, a personality test that says, well, this is just who defines me or what defines me. So what do we have today? Well, we've got ethnic battles, we've got race battles, we've got personality battles. Uh, you know, we, we, we're, we get caught up in all, all the race agenda here in America. I want to tell you, this is nothing compared to other nations. In our text, this is where we're going to bring it home now. Peter is now being called to reach and preach in an area that he's completely out of his element. Told you I'm going to shift directions. Probably not going to go where you thought I was going to go. Completely out of, outside of everything he has ever grown up to know. He's a Jew. And we're going to talk about the text all around this scripture. But he comes to this revelation, amen, that God is not a respecter of persons. He don't care if you're black, if you're white, if you're yellow, if you're fuchsia, if you're whatever those weird colors are out there, amen. He just cares that you're a human soul, amen, and if you'll surrender your life to him, he'll save you. So let's... Let me just, I'm going to shift the direction here. Finding your identity. Because isn't that what this is really about? We live in a world where people don't know who they are. As Pastor Mitchell said, they couldn't hit their butt with both hands looking in a mirror. And here we are in this world, identity crisis. So what do we do? We, 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 we make these methods in which they can identify as somebody. Well, I'm an alpha male. What is that? You know, the whole thing is based off of a, the, the description of a wolf. I'm an alpha male. You're going to go around howling everywhere now? Listen, I'm sure these things have their purpose and they, they help in some instances. Uh, but uh, if we're not careful as Christians, uh, we can get caught up in all this uh, personality types, uh, all these things uh, that begin to define humanity. But listen, we're defined by one thing, and that is Jesus Christ. So I do believe... In our text, we're going to read some before and after this text and bring it all home, but Peter was having an identity crisis. He was a Jew, raised as a Jew, did everything as a Jew, but now as God is calling him, I want you to go preach to these Gentiles. I want you to step out of your comfort zone to this people that eats different, they act different, they behave different, and I want you to go and I want you to reach them. You know, just a short while before our text in Acts 10, 34, verse 11 through 16, here's Peter. He's having a dream. Amen. It's in, in verse 10, it said he was very hungry, and then he begins to have a dream about food. It says, I saw heaven open, and a certain vessel descended unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners, and let down to earth, wherein all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, wild beasts, and creepy things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, eat, or kill, and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God has cleansed, you do not call uncommon. Or you, you do not call common. This was done three times, and the vessel was received up again to heaven. Amen. And again, it said he was hungry. I don't know. Maybe he went to sleep. He's dreaming about some barbecue now. He's a Jew, and God's given him visions uh, of some barbecued chicken, uh, amen, some smoked ribs, uh, amen, some bacon-wrapped jalapenos. Glory to God. Amen. God, I can't eat that. Y'all yeah, wonder if God's like, you know what, Peter, I'm going to show you this three times. He's like, listen, brother, don't knock it till you try it. Verse, verse 17, it says, Now while Peter 
doubted in himself. This vision which he should he seen should be me. Well, <laughs> excuse me. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had should should mean, Peter was struggling with this. He's now struggling with his identity. God, I've been this way my whole life. And you're asking me to be somebody else. You're, you're asking me to, to reach a people that don't, don't eat the things I eat. They don't do the things I do. They don't, they don't believe the things I believe. And God, you're, you're, what you're telling me is you want me to go now preach to them. He's struggling. God, what does this mean? Is God calling me to preach? Is he, you know, he's calling me to preach this different culture. Is he calling me to eat these different foods? Is he calling me, uh, you know, to have a different sense of humor? I'm going to tell you, when we were in China, I did not find the same things funny that they find funny. Their humor is completely different. Look, look at that carpet. <laughs> what? And I don't say that to mock them. I, I said that to their face over there. I'm like, what are you laughing at? <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> See, this means, Peter, you have to deny everything that you've ever been taught and believe in. It's not, not, it doesn't mean we leave the faith. It just means that maybe there's some things that don't matter in order for us to reach the lost. How many come into the kingdom and God calls them into uncomfortable arenas? See, what that means is we've got to learn to obey God. Not just at the, at the altar when we get saved, we quit sinning. God has a purpose for us. He didn't call you just to come and fill that chair tonight. God has something for you to do in his kingdom. He has a purpose for you. Amen. Uh, praise God. If you're involved in, in ministry, doing things, but what else? Does God have a city for you? Does he have a nation with your name on it? You say, but man, that's just so far in the distance. So what? If God's calling you, then you need to give every aspect of your life to that until it comes to pass. You know, in Acts chapter 10, verse 20 through 22, I'm not going to read it, but... Uh, here, here, here now Peter's commanded you rise, go down. I want you to meet with Cornelius. He goes down with, with, with his entourage, amen, of other Jewish people, amen. And he goes to meet Cornelius and look what, uh, what, what verse 28 and 29 says. And uh, it says, and he said to them, you know how it is unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. He's recognizing what's going on here. Peter's now talking to this Gentile, and he says, listen, you, you even know this. I'm not supposed to be doing this. But God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying. Or another translation would say, I was obedient to God as soon as I was sent for. There, uh, I ask, therefore, what intent have you sent for me? So now Peter, in his, his identity crisis, even in the midst of that, he hears from God, he obeys God, and right here and then, there's a revelation that comes. Cornelius says, now therefore, we all here, present before God, we are here to hear the things that are commanded of you from God. Are you grasping this tonight? Peter had to come out of his comfort zone because God was dealing with the unregenerate, unsaved, backslidden uh, 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 Gentiles of the world. God is speaking to Cornelius and tells Cornelius, I want you to call for Peter. Peter, in obedience, comes back to Cornelius. Uh, and now Cornelius is sitting there with all his family, all his friends. Uh, amen. And he says, now we are here. We're ready to listen. Tell us what we need to hear. Can I tell you something? God will prepare hearts to receive the gospel. God already, I believe, is preparing hearts to receive the gospel. Some of you are here because God has been preparing your hearts to receive the message I'm preaching tonight. 
So what's God's ultimate purpose in this then? God is preparing a people in spite of our personality differences for you and I to go minister to. Peter begins to preach to these people. <laughs> this is such an amazing story. Because if you pick up in verse 34 through 43... Uh, excuse me, uh, he begins to preach to the people in verses 34 through 43, and then right as he's preaching, something supernatural happens. Verse 44, while Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision, this is Peter's entourage, uh, which believed they were astonished, as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles God poured out this, uh, the gift of the Holy Ghost um, for they heard them speak uh, with tongues and magnify God. That's Holy Ghost right there. That's the God I serve. Amen. That while we're yet preaching God can touch hearts. Uh, amen. Begin to transform their lives before they ever even hit an altar. I call this the personality tests because, you know, a lot of times we don't do what God wants us to do because we're incompatible. Some of you are guilty of this, right? You're out outreaching. You run into a Spanish speaker. Hello. Learn your Spanish songs. It helps. I promise. I poder, I poder. Just start singing to them. <laughs> Some of you, you run into a, another nationality or another race and you start looking around, oh, what's, where's another black guy? Where's another Navajo? You know, let me get them to come witness. Maybe God puts you at their door because he wants you to witness to them. Hello. What if Peter would have failed this test? What if Peter didn't step out of his comfort zone? I believe this is a challenge to you and I tonight. Because God chooses what we least expect to reach people we least expect. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 27 says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. That's the way God works. Amen. He puts a Mexican pastor in Ogden, Utah. Hello. He brings a, can I say it? A white assistant pastor. In case you didn't know what, what I was. I want you to look around here though. Look around. Look at all, all the different nationalities in our church. That's a work of God. That's something God does. You know, can I say this? Me and Pastor Martinez, we're, we're not compatible. <laughs> he's, he's a gangbanger from California. Okay, did drugs hurt people? Stabbed him. Listen, the worst fight I ever got was in sixth grade at the playground. <laughs> never smoked, never, never did drugs, never drank beer. It was a miracle of God that never happened, I'll be honest. Grew up in backwoods, Missouri. Had, had more cows next to me than people. See, this is a work of God, church. God says, Peter, I want you, a Jew, to go preach to Cornelius, a Gentile. You know, I do believe God is preparing Corneliuses out there. You know, when we were in Provo, on a regular outreach, we're just, uh, uh, we, might have, we might have been an impact team in there, but we're outreaching. Many of you know, remember the Boulders Apartments Complex? I mean, remember that, that one. It's, uh, that was where all our fruit came from, man. That's a, 
it was probably 75% uh, uh, Mexicans in there. And, uh, you know, we outreached there a lot, did movies and all kinds of, but I remember knocking on a door one day and this, this, this older gentleman, probably I'd say at the time, maybe, uh, uh, in, maybe in his early fifties, not that old, but, uh, he's, he answers the door and, and, uh, I begin to talk to him and realize really quickly, he doesn't understand a word I'm saying, at least I thought, right. And, and, uh, you know, uh, once he heard the word Jesus, uh, He's like, what, wait. He shuts the door, and he opens it back up, and he says, come in, come in, come in. I mean, I'm telling you, it's, it was one of these God moments, like God had prepared this man. I walk in the house, and his, his family of six is there, um, and, uh, you know, he, I, I know a little bit of Spanish, and he says, uh, mi, mi familia, uh, la, la, la oración. In other words, I, I want you to pray for my whole family. I, I want you to pray this. He, he, I can't remember how exactly he said it, but I understood. He wanted to pray the sinner's prayer with his whole family. I barely even got to say a word to him about Jesus. But God was preparing, uh, and that whole family got saved and started coming to church. I've, I've shared this story uh, uh, in part but, you know, in, in Tucson, I mentioned a minute ago, we had, we had eight different nationalities coming to church on a pretty consistent basis. Uh, and, and, but what, one of the, 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 the um, thrustings that took that church to the next level is we did a three-day revival and, and, uh, and uh, these three Nepalese people came into church from Nepal. Right, this is just just above India. Uh, you know, they're they're there. They're they're um, uh, they're they're refugees. They they had issues in their country. They were actually Bhutanese people that were already refugees in Nepal. Had a barbecue, went bad, burned down the village, and now they're you know made national news and ended up in America. And now they're in my church. Long story, but <laughs> that's that's the quick version. <laughs> uh, they come into church, and we start just working with them and. And, uh, you know, I realized, man, there's, there's, there's some potential here. And I'm like, you gotta understand like these, these, there, there's, there's third world and there's third world. These, these people don't, don't know what a screwdriver looks like. They don't know. Uh, I mean, they tied their houses together with strings, uh, um, bamboo huts at the, at the bottom of the Himalaya mountains. Uh, and, and now they're trying to make it in a society that if you, <laughs> they don't know nothing. I mean, uh, they, 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 they it was a wild scene, and it took me out of my comfort zone because they began to want to invite us over to the house, and uh, we come over to the house. I remember the first time we, we, we sat down for dinner, they gave me this plate of chicken curry, um, rice, and some other mixture of vegetables. I don't even know what it is I ate to this day, but they didn't give me any silverware, and I sat there, and and. and and one of their customs is, is you feed your guests first, you watch them while they eat, and you feed them, and then you eat afterwards. So me and my wife, were sitting there, and they got this plate in front of me with no silverware, and they're looking at me, what, you don't like it? <laughs> I said, no, how do I eat it? And they're like, oh, <laughs> and, and they pick up the plate, and you're like, with your hand. I was like, uh-oh. -uh. But we ate, we, we got down, man. I mean, you learn to start shoveling stuff with your hand. That's, that's acceptable there. That's cool. <laughs> I'm not saying you go start doing that at home now. I mean, we're, but, <clears throat> but what's powerful that began to happen is we, you know, God's, God's touching these lives. And so I, I, I scheduled a revival about a month and a half later, later with Ashgar Gafur because he spoke Hindu. And these, these people spoke a, a version of, of Hindu. And uh, we had that revival. And I remember in, in, in one of those first nights, it might have even been before that, uh, you know, we see these, these three people, they're coming to church. Uh, and one of the nights, all of a sudden, there's one, two, three. Just, I mean, they kept coming. And we went from three Nepalese to working with over 40 Nepalese. Our church doubled in a week. You know, it's so easy to watch people come into church 
and watch them walk back out. Never say hi. Never invite them out to dinner. Never, never invite them over to your house. But listen, God's calling us to step out of our comfort zone. I'm going to say some of you have never had anybody over at your house. Maybe God wants you to have somebody over to your house. Well, that's too small. I'm going to tell you, we had a fellowship in a house in, in China. I don't even think I measure anything. The, the room we were fellowshipping, it was as big as that, 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 that sound room over there. And there was about, I don't know, what would you say, 12 people in there? Uh, Humin's house. It was small. And they don't believe in turning their heater on in the winter to save electricity. We were all in there eating hot pot in our coats, uh, playing games, uh, and having a Holy Ghost time. Uh, amen. If she can do it, we can do it. So how do you pass the test then? You and I have to get ready. 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you about the reason of hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. Listen, God is preparing us for revival. At least he's trying to. The question is, are you preparing for revival? You know, we're going to be having uh, potentially, uh, we might have potentially 14 people from China coming. Uh, I'm praying that it goes through from both our churches over there. And so, uh, you know, praise God. You know, that we're going to, you know, hopefully put them up in a room. But what, what about sponsoring them? What about just letting them see how a Christian lives? So I'm going to tell you, some of these people, they think, well, that's just your, that's just your Western religion. But opening up a house, say, you know what, come, come, come see me be a Christian. That This wasn't just Pastor Austin. This just wasn't Pastor Barry. I mean, this is who we are as Christians. And, and everywhere we go around the world, this is how we act. This is how we behave. This is how a Christian lives. Let the Holy Ghost speak to you tonight. There's people in here right now, amen, they're, they're just looking for somebody to fellowship with them. Just looking for a friend. Looking for somebody to care for them. Uh, looking to be loved. Looking for acceptance, uh, amen. But what are you doing about it? I want to challenge the church tonight. Listen, we, we are seeing an influx of people. This morning we had 16 visitors in church. I think, what, like 10 people saved uh, a bunch of visitors tonight. We had visitors last night at the concert. And God's bringing them because that's what we ask for. Amen? Now let's do our part, church. Let's, let's step out in faith uh, and believe God. God, you can use me. God, I know you can take me out of my comfort zone. Uh, amen? God, I'm willing to step out of my comfort zone uh, and go into those regions beyond uh, that I've never stepped foot in before if I may win at least one. Amen? I want us to bow our hearts in this place just for a second. <clears throat> bow our hearts just for a moment. Listen in this place as our musicians begin to make their way up here. Maybe this is your first time coming to church. Maybe it's not. And you're, you're not saved. You're not right with God. Listen, the first order of service here is you've got to give your life to Jesus. I don't command that. I, I, I beg you to do that. Listen, our time is short. Jesus Christ is coming back. Uh, amen. Uh, you look at what's happening all over the world. Uh, uh, that Just the chaos, earthquakes and volcanoes and pestilences and diseases and viruses. Uh, that's, that's, that, that was foretold. Uh, amen. Jesus said this is going to happen in the last days. Uh, amen. Before the Son of Man cometh. But he says uh, this is just the beginning of sorrows. And the Holy Spirit would deal with you tonight. You've come because somebody who loves and cares for you invited you to come hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is the very simple gospel that 
God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And tonight, if you will repent of your sin, if you'll acknowledge your sin and repent of it and turn your eyes to Jesus, turn your life to Jesus, the Bible says you'll be saved. You've come, maybe you're broken, you're empty, you're hurting. You know, the Bible says Jesus was tempted in every way as you and I, but remained without sin. Not only was an example for us, but he paid the price for our sin. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And you come tonight and you're carrying all these sins and these burdens and how could God ever forgive me? I'll tell you how, because he loves you that much. And he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross of Calvary so that you don't have to. I wonder tonight you come and you say, you know what, I'm, I'm tired of fighting this. I'm tired of uh, living in my sin and, and it weighing me down. I want to be set free tonight. I want to make Jesus Lord of my life. I want to repent and get right with God. If that's you, while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, uh, lift your hand right in your seat where you're at. Uh, lift it all over this place. God bless you. Amen. There's others. God's dealing with you. Amen. Uh, you could put that hand down. Thank you for your honesty. There's others. God's dealing with you right now. Lift your hand. Uh, say, Jesus, please set me free. Jesus, please forgive me. That's you all over this place. Uh, maybe you're back you once served God but you turned away you turned your back on God but God is still beckoning you come back turn away from that sin and turn back to me God would say would you get right with God tonight you're backslidden so you know I need to get right with God lift your hand I need Jesus to come in and set me free. Anybody at all. Hallelujah. Thank you for that honesty. You can put that hand down. God bless you. Maybe there's others. God's dealing with you. I want to hold this just a little bit longer. I feel the Holy Ghost tonight. God's speaking to hearts. He's challenging you in this place. And he wants to touch you. Amen. We're going to change the order of service. Listen, if you lifted your hand, I want you to do one thing. Get up out of your seat and come meet me at this altar. Brother, come. We're going to have somebody come pray with you. I need a man to come help me pray. Uh, another brother back here prayed. Hallelujah. Praise God. Appreciate you, man. God bless you. Brother Tony is going to come pray, pray with you. Hallelujah. I've seen another hand. Amen. You can invite him to come up. Maybe you see uh, visitors, Christians, gently invite them to come. Receive Jesus at this altar. I want to open these altars. I believe God's dealing with hearts in this place. God's challenging. God even probably put some names of people on your heart as I was preaching. And God wants you to go visit, wants you to follow up on, wants you to minister to. Hallelujah. I challenge you tonight as you come and pray. Check your identity. Are you allowing the world to identify who you are? Or are you allowing Jesus to identify? Are you being obedient to God? Push aside. I know we all have our different personalities, but God has a mission for us tonight. And that's to reach the world for Jesus. It doesn't matter if you're an introvert, if you're an extrovert. Uh, whatever your personality type is, it doesn't matter. Some might even say Moses was an introvert some would even say Paul was an extrovert yet they both obeyed Christ say God I'm willing to obey you no matter what hallelujah let's sing that song we fall down we fall down we lay our ground at the feet Greatness of His mercy and love at the feet of Jesus.
Masiko Robo Botan Yarama. Thank you, Jesus. We give you glory. We give you praise, my King. Worthy, worthy, worthy is your name. Hallelujah. You know, I'm in awe so often what God has 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 used me for. And I, you know, it's I, I I I know who I am. Hello. Amen. You know who you are. And you say, man, God, how could you ever use me? Don't, this isn't meant to sound bad, but God says, I, I choose the foolish things. We're foolish. <laughs> Hello. And he chooses us. You're here tonight. If for nothing else, the Holy Spirit drew you. God drew you. And he has a plan for you. He wants to do something with your life. Amen. We're going we're gonna to dismiss, but I, I just want to challenge you. Tomorrow's a day of prayer and fasting. This is something I would challenge all of us that we would lay before God. That we, we would pray for a Peter vision. That almost sounds like some kind of like television broadcasting. Peter vision. <laughs> we might need that, man. You got a TV, turn on Peter vision. Man, you need to have that vision of the sheets. Maybe it's not unclean animals. Uh, maybe it's another language of people you're scared to talk to. Maybe it's another race of people you're scared to talk to. And God would say, you know what? I'm, I'm calling you to step out of that because there's a whole world out there I want to reach and let, let them know about my son. Amen. Lay that before God tomorrow. Fast and pray over that. Uh, and be telling people about Jesus in the process and watch what God will do with your life. Amen. We're going to dismiss tonight. Let's go our way. Tell somebody about Jesus. Fellowship with somebody tonight. Um, amen. But why don't we bow our hearts in a time of prayer. Hallelujah. Why don't, uh, uh, Chubbs, why don't you close us in prayer tonight?